An issue that might come up for you as a writer is how to go about adapting another culture's folklore respectfully. Because folklore's cool and offers a rich tapestry of stories and such to take inspiration from. The thing is, to an outsider, someone else's folklore might appear like old legends in the same vein as Greek or Norse mythology. But to them, it's still deeply meaningful, if not religiously significant. That's where you have to be wary of cultural appropriation. I personally define cultural appropriation as taking something that is culturally significant without understanding the significance of that thing, and in the process, disrespecting the people who find it meaningful. It's a really simple concept to understand because it's not exclusive to cultures. Anyone who's seen one of their favorite stories get a shitty modern adaptation should have a good idea of what it's like. So if you wantonly disregard what people consider cultural appropriation, you're a dickhead. They can't see what all those dames see in you. You're a stick in the mud. These are not Sokka and Katara. This is not an elf. And that is not a Wendigo. That being said, there is cultural appreciation, which is just as valid and can actually be pretty beneficial. The key to cultural appreciation is, well, genuine appreciation. Having respect for the culture you're adapting from and actually learning about it, so you can understand the significance of what you're trying to adapt and how that culture would like it to be portrayed. A good adaptation, regardless of what you're adapting, should pay homage to the original's meaning and message so that the values of the source will be reflected in the adaptation and the moral of the story remains about the same. As filmmakers, as writers, we had no interest whatsoever in putting our junk, our baggage into these movies. We, we just thought we, we should take what Tolkien cared about clearly. We should take those and we should put them into the film. My favorite example, which I've already mentioned, is the Wendigo. The pop culture Wendigo is a flesh-eating forest demon with a deer head that has virtually no connection with the original Algonquin legend. The first thing to know is that the story of the Wendigo comes from a mostly oral tradition and from multiple cultures, so there is no one authoritative version. As I understand it, and I'm certainly no authority, the general thread that ties these stories together is that the Wendigo is a spirit that personifies forces that tear communities apart, specifically greed or selfishness. The Wendigo isn't necessarily always a tangible monster either. It's more like a force, it's a spirit, that influences and possesses people to do selfish, evil things to the detriment of their community. The basics go something like this. In the frigid hellscape of the Great Lakes region, which I call home, the Wendigo came with the cold and drove people to greed and selfishness during the harsh winter months, when things were tough and people should be sticking together. The whole cannibalism thing everyone associates the Wendigos with is just a metaphor for greed, nourishing yourself off your fellow man. But that's just the Cliff Notes version, and there are lots of other Wendigo stories. One I read had the Wendigo asking a guy to fatten himself up and build a fire to cook himself on while it just chilled out and stuck its overlarge anus in the air, if I remember correctly. It was strange, but the moral of the story was a warning against greed, where if you're selfish, you're really in service of something that will turn around to bite you. Just told in a way that's hard to follow for anyone outside the culture and time it was recorded since they lacked the frame of reference to make it make sense to them. Having also read old European stories, I can tell you they aren't any less strange, like Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, where the knight rolls up into King Arthur's court, asks to be beheaded, is beheaded but is unharmed, and rides off holding his head, after a bunch of other hijinks involving gifts being exchanged for kisses. The story ends with the Green Knight revealing he was just magicked up and it was all a test for Gawain, with the moral being to always be honest. It probably made more sense to medieval people, but doesn't make much sense to me. So yeah, this isn't just, you know, a Native American thing, it's sort of a universal thing. While the Wendigo is represented in very strange ways and stories, it isn't just a fictional monster to the cultures it comes from, even today. Algonquin religions and how they're practiced are complex, and I am absolutely no authority, so I cannot and will not attempt to speak on it, other than to say that they don't see spirits like the Wendigo 
in the sort of casual way modern Christians see pop culture demons, at least as far as I've heard, but again, not in authority. The point is that you just should not treat them lightly like you would a werewolf or a vampire. The Wendigo is seen as either representing or actually being a genuine threat, something that very well could come and prey upon your community by pushing someone you know to evil. I'll put it this way, while I don't believe in the Wendigo, I don't not believe in it either. I live in the Wendigo's home turf, and it's impossible to look at the world today and deny that greed pushing people to evil and destructive acts isn't a real thing. Hello, I'm Peter Pravik, the chairman of Nestle. The Nestle Gruppe, the größten, uh, the größten Lebensmittelkonzern. There are apparently some misconceptions about my ideas on water. Also, water is actually the most raw material that we have today. Let me make it clear from the beginning. That means, as a man, you should have the right to have water. That is the one extreme solution. I have always supported the human right to water. Water is a lebensmittel. You know, I mean, there's a guy from Nestle that doesn't think water is a human right. I personally believe it is better that one gives a Lebensmittel a value, so that we are all aware that that it costs something. I mean, that guy should be hunted down and shot. Yeah. Right? A modern example of a Wendigo story that might be easier to understand than the butthole one, and that shows how the Wendigo is still relevant today, comes from The Roundhouse by Louise Erdrich. It's a crime novel about a young boy trying to discover the identity of his mother's rapist. Throughout the story, you see the destructive effects of the criminal's selfish actions on the community, and he even gets identified as a Wendigo in the book, being related to a traditional Wendigo story, and you can easily see the connection. It's definitely a good, really interesting book, and I highly suggest it to you. And, uh, hey guys, get this. You won't believe it, but I have a My Little Pony related example for you of how to do this kind of adaptation right. In My Little Pony, there's a holiday called Hearth Swarming, which celebrates the unification of the Earth Ponies, Unicorns, and Pegasi. The episode is told as a rendition of an equestrian folktale, detailing how the pony tribes came together, and how much life sucked for everyone before they did. The story goes that, long ago, each tribe lived separately, but because of each race's unique abilities, they still remain dependent on each other for survival. Earth ponies can grow food, pegasi control the weather, and unicorns control the day-night cycle. Because of their separation, but codependence, they were distrustful of each other, which created animosity between them. This prompted the mysterious arrival of a harsh blizzard that brought things to a head. All three groups were starving and freezing, and they each blamed the others for the storm. And as their animosity grew, so did the severity of the storm. A council was held with the hope that the three tribes could find some way to weather the blizzard together. But all the leaders did was throw blame around and bicker. All three are self-important, uncooperative racists. What a shocker! An earth pony with no ideas! <laughs> and after the council, we get to see how they also completely disregard their own subjects as well. Each leader decides to strike it on their own and try to find a new place to live beyond the effects of the blizzard. Lo and behold, they all found the same place, and each claimed it for their own and began to fight over it. Surprise, surprise, it began to snow, and the ponies retreated to a cave for shelter from the blizzard, only to start fighting over which part of the cave belonged to who. The cave soon became encased in ice, which swallowed the three bickering leaders, leaving only their level-headed subordinates huddling together in the center as the ice crept towards them. Real spooky stuff. At this point, Twilight's character figures out what's going on and delivers the obligatory This is the Moral speech. They're winter spirits that feed off fighting and hatred. The more hate the spirit feels, the colder things become. They say that they don't hate each other, even if their leaders do, and as the ice begins to consume them, they look to each other for support. And in doing so, they drive off the Wendigos with the fire of friendship in a scene that is both badass and dorkly girly in equal measure, which is basically My Little Pony's stock and trade, and I love it. 
The fire eventually thawed out the leaders and warmed the cave enough for them to escape, and having learned about the power of friendship, they came together and founded Equestria. The End what matters here is how they blended the My Little Pony formula with the traditional Wendigo story. They have the moral about being a good friend and how supporting and caring for one another is better than not doing that, but they seamlessly interwove that with the morals of a Wendigo story, a warning against selfishness, greed, and putting oneself over the needs of the community, using the bitter cold as a framing device to boot. If the Wendigo had been just another monster for the main six to blast with the rainbow friendship lasers, that would have been bad. But instead, to recap, the Wendigo is a mythical spirit that feeds off the pony's greed and distrust, and encourages it by bringing the cold, and it is part of a culturally significant story warning against selfishness, and with the moral that communities are stronger when people look out for each other. It stays true to the moral of the original stories, while still putting a unique twist on it. So, I at least think that this was a pretty good adaptation of another culture's folklore, and a good example of how to adapt something respectfully as a whole. So, yeah. Like if you enjoyed, subscribe if you enjoy my other stuff as well, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.